As miners in the 15th century began hauling their ore from the copper mines of the German countryside, they noticed something strange. Some of their ore looked a bit off, seeming a bit lighter and almost shiny compared to the ore that they were used to. It was close enough though, so they brought it with them to the smelters. As copper smelters began the usual refinement process of the ore, they found that this other ore was turning a silvery color, and the metal proved extremely difficult to work with. Because of its peculiar, seemingly unusable properties, miners and smelters began to avoid the metal as best they could, while giving it the name Kumpfernickel, which translated to the Devil's Copper. But over the next few centuries, many uses would be found for this Devil's Copper, one of which is on the billions of coins used throughout the United States in exchange for goods and services. But the path to the nickel was never as simple as it may seem, and it all started with the Civil War. This is Learn Something New. Back before the Civil War, the state of money within the United States was a bit… messy. The US had made several attempts at minting their own currency, with many gold and silver coins being in circulation, as well as some paper currency known as greenbacks. Banks, too, had their own forms of cash, often local to their small communities, and it was often a nightmare to exchange one town's banknotes for another without clear conversion rates. Not to mention, this private cash was rife with counterfeiting. As tensions around the Civil War escalated, faith in private and federal paper currency fell dramatically. Many at the time believed that even if the country collapsed into all-out war, the gold and silver coins that the government had issued at the very least could be melted down into their valuable metals to be exchanged. As the southern states began seceding in 1861, people began hoarding any money made of metal, especially precious metals. This was disastrous for the US Mint, who didn't have enough metal on hand to print enough currency to account for the hoarding, and the economic ramifications were quick to follow. Stores would report that they couldn't take certain denominations of currency because they had nothing to make change with. Some places even started using stamps as a form of small denomination currency. Private banks kept trying to push their own currencies, but as more competing currencies entered into the mix, it became extremely difficult to know what their value even was, and how much people should be charged for goods. In 1864, the US was working to replace all forms of currency with paper, even denominations that were less than a dollar. They managed to get 150,000 silver half-dimes into circulation, but it simply wasn't enough, and it was draining the reserves of silver the US often used to trade with other nations overseas, something they could not afford to lose while fighting the Civil War. Thus, they printed a five-cent note. But people were thrown off when they saw the new money. The National Currency Bureau of the time, the part of the government that was in charge of handling these currency issues the Union had been having, was led by a man named Spencer Clark. One of Spencer Clark's duties was to work on the design of the new bill, including the portrait of the individual printed onto it. Think George Washington on the $1 bill or Andrew Jackson on the $20. Well, what had surprised those who saw the currency was that Spencer Clark, leader of the National Currency Bureau, had put his own picture on the new bill. He had never asked Congress, or the President, or anyone if this was okay, he just decided to place his own image onto the money. This, consequently, turned into a huge scandal, both among the public and within Congress, with one letter written to the New York Times saying, It shows the form of impudence in a way seldom attempted before. It is not the first time, however, that men have made a strike for fame and only achieved notoriety. But while Congress was busy denouncing Spencer Clark for what he did, a businessman named Joseph Wharton was telling Congress to focus more on a path forward than on the mistakes of the past. They couldn't keep relying on precious metals to make their currency, but they could find different metals to use. Now, this had already been done before. Given the low monetary value of the penny, it had been minted using copper, giving the one cent coin the name it was referred to at the time, the copper. But it was unclear what the next step should be. Well, Joseph Wharton had an idea. They could use the relative abundance of nickel. And it didn't even have to be all nickel either. They could simply make copper coins, then coat the outer layer with nickel to help distinguish them from the penny. Within two months, the five-cent bills ceased production, and in 1866, 
Andrew Johnson signed a bill authorizing the minting of five cent coins made of copper and nickel. As a final jab to Spencer Clark for putting his own picture on the five cent bill, Congress passed a law outlawing the use of any living person's image or likeness on currency notes, paper bonds, or securities. That year, in 1866, 15 million five cent coins were minted, over 100 times the amount the government had managed with the silver coins. And over the next two years, another 30 million had entered circulation. Nickels, as they had become known due to their outer coating, became the preferred coin of the late 1800s. It was seen as convenient to use because there were just so many of them, contrasted with the rarity of many of the other denominations, though the US Mint also produced a 3 cent version made similarly of copper and nickel. The 5 cent nickel's prominence was also part of the reason that a bottle of Coca-Cola cost a mere 5 cents for over 70 years straight, a topic which I covered in another video that I'll link at the end of this one. After a flood of nickels hit the economy, it coincided with the end of the Civil War, and there was a post-war boom. But the real winner ended up being Joseph Wharton. You see, the man who had persuaded Congress to switch over to nickels had made a big bet. In the early years of the Civil War, Joseph Wharton had made a significant investment into many nickel mines throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He had approached the legislators within Congress with the proposal of making America's future currency using nickel to directly enrich himself in his mines. And it worked. He ended up making millions off his nickel mines by the 1870s. And US citizens were left with a new type of coin. Today, nickels are composed of 25% nickel and 75% copper. But even though nickel was initially sought after for its availability and relatively cheaper cost of acquisition, there's a new problem. There have been numerous calls for years to discontinue the penny from circulation because it costs over three cents to produce a single one cent penny. But the nickel is hardly much better. As of 2023, the cost for each nickel is over 11 and a half cents. Chances are, if the penny gets cut from the circulation of currency, the nickel isn't far behind. Unless they can find yet another way to lower the cost of production. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. Please consider giving the video a like as it lets me know that you found the video interesting and it helps the video get pushed in the algorithm. Click here to watch the video about Coca-Cola getting stuck with the 5 cent soda for nearly a century. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the channel's patrons who have helped support me even as I worked through some issues with YouTube over the past few months. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.